Hey everybody, I'm Joe. Thank you for joining me. I'm here with a replay of round five of a modern friendly league. I'm currently sitting at 4-0. and After having defeated an Esper Death Shadow uh, round one, and then Mono Green Tron, Jund, and Hexproof. <clears throat> Looks like I lost the die roll in the fifth round, so opponent's going to be on the play. Uh, this is a nice hand, uh, certainly very keepable. Uh, the opponent, let's see, did he keep his seven? They did, and we will, so let's see what we're up against here. Basic Swamp into Thought Seas. Uh, in this situation, I feel like the opponent has to take the Ether Vial. Uh, we don't have double blue, so um, we're going to need to draw into another blue source before we can even play these cards. Uh, yeah, so Ether Vial seems like the easy choice here. And that's what the opponent took. So I drew into that second blue source right on time. I'll play the blue source that the opponent knows about and just drop a Curse Catcher this turn. So we, don't, we can't really tell what we're up against here. Um, basic Swamp into Thoughtseize could be anything. It could be 8-Rack, <laughs> it could be Jund, could be some Death Shadow build. Bloodstained Mire. Starting to point more in a Jundy direction. Oh, but there's Watery Graves, so Grix is something. My opponent's hitting his life total pretty hard between Thoughtseize and the Shock uh, and Fetch. So Serum Vision, I guess we have to open the chat here, uh, see what we're dealing with. Bottom, bottom. Okay, so it's good for us. And they're just going to pass. So opponent already down to 15, feeling good about that. Can swing in with the Curse Catcher. Nothing to do in our first main phase. Opponent's probably just going to go down to 14. It looks like that's what happened, and... Uh, Play the Mutavolt that they know about, and just play the other Curse Catcher here. Uh, not really knowing what we're up against, but some sort of Grixis build. Uh, they might be playing like Tassiger or Gurmag Angler, in which case bouncing them is uh, pretty excellent because they um, run through their graveyard resources pretty quickly with those Delve creatures. So get our second Curse Catcher out. Pretty slow development, but the opponent's going to waste a fatal push on Curse Catcher, uh, potentially indicating that they have a really important 3-drop they want to resolve, although I have a second Curse Catcher here that could counter that. Uh, maybe they have like a Snapcaster just to um, recur the fatal push. I don't know. Seems strange. So I'll, I sacrifice the Curse Catcher to counter the fatal push. It's just how I roll. Okay, second thought sees, which is unfortunate because they're almost certainly going to take away Kira, which I run as a singleton. Again, hitting their life total, they'll already be down to 12. Um, following up with a Serum Visions, open up our chat again, and we see top and top. So, potentially more scary stuff in the pipeline. So the opponent's below 13, they can uh, drop a Death Shadow if that's in fact what they're planning on doing. Another land, don't feel too great about that. Just play one of them, activate Mutavault, and swing in. If the opponent wants to uh, bolt my Mutavault or something, I have the Curse Catcher ready to protect him. Protect it, I don't know if Mutavault is a guy or a girl. Alright, opponent's already down to 9, haven't really seen any action from them at all. Well, here's a Death Shadow. It's a 4-4, and another Bloodstained Mire. When you play against Death Shadow, you have to be really careful when they have uh, multiple fetch lands out, because that can change the power of Death Shadow <clears throat> really quickly. Uh, so, representing a uh, three-point life swing on each uh, fetch into shock could immediately go down to three life and make Death Shadow a 10-10, and then you know, Teamer Battle Rage uh, for 20. I don't even know if these decks are still playing Teamer Battle Rage. Uh, as, I, as you guys know, I've been out of the game for a couple months, so uh, not quite sure if these builds are really similar to the uh, previous sort of suicide, death shadow, aggro type builds. Alright, so we drew an Echoing Truth. Uh, currently can't really attack into this death shadow, but we just hit our fourth land, so we've got uh, mana up for Harbinger. It's just a situation where we have to pass the turn. 
We're both on three cards. Both have four lands. Both have one creature out, but I have a Muta Vault on my side. Let's see if the opponent wants to attack with the Death Shadow here. So they know I have the Harbinger. I think, though, in this situation, we pass, obviously, to the end of um, blocks to see if he has any effects. Say he wants to crack these uh, fetches and go get some shock lands, go down to three. We can wait until all those effects are done and then um, try to bounce the Death Shadow with Harbinger of the Tides. <clears throat> but in this case, uh, if he's going to apparently be content to leave him as a 4-4, four -four, it's probably best just to take the 4, wait until the end of the turn, and then uh, then bounce this guy so that he can't recast him. But in this case, the opponent played out a second Death Shadow, which makes Echoing Truth, I think, the uh, the better option here, getting some value out of this very flexible spell. Trying to bounce both of the opponent's creatures on the end step. Alright, so Mutavault and Island, casting Echoing Truth, but the opponent uh, answers it with a stubborn denial. So um, I'm learning a little bit more uh, how these Grixis Death Shadow decks work. Main deck Stubborn Denial is very interesting to see in Modern. I haven't seen this uh, really at all in Modern. So it says counter target non-creature spell unless its controller pays one. So sort of like a bad spell pierce, but it gets better, much better, if you uh, control a creature with power four or greater, in which case you just counter that spell straight up. It just becomes negate. So in this case, he has a couple of creatures with power four or greater. So Stubborn Denial is just going to uh, straight up counter the Echoing Truth with two uh, lands up. I can't really do anything about it with Curse Catcher. So he took four that turn, drew another land. Uh, this time we can just hard cast the Harbinger since he already has a tapped creature over there. Hard cast? No, just uh, main phase it, I guess is what I mean to say. Bounce uh, one of these Death Shadows and pass to the opponent. Opponent's still sitting at nine life. I'd love to apply more pressure, but we keep drawing into lands. All right, straight to combat. Uh, still not very afraid of this guy. I'm going to wait to see what happens here. All right, so... I mean, that's, that's interesting. I didn't block. Again, he could have taken his life total down to three and made this guy into a 10-10 after I declared no blocks, putting me all the way down to two. If he played out a second Death Shadow, uh, I guess he doesn't know what I have in my hand and he's playing a little bit conservative. Uh, conservatively, if I had a, a bounce spell or something. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly why he chose uh, not to crack the, the fetch lands, but this guy presumably knows more about the mechanics of his deck than I do. He plays out another land. The opponent's down to one card with two Death Shadows on the board. So Master of Waves, uh, very welcome uh, after having drawn a bunch of lands. It's going to give us a bunch of blockers uh, to throw in front of these Death Shadows and give us a, a bunch of attackers to hopefully get the opponent uh, further further down, closer to zero life. Let's see. So we're going to get four, uh, four elementals. Still can't really attack right now. All right, so opponent up to two cards. Goes to his attack step, decides just to pass through, and um, that's it. For my turn, I drew an Island Walk Lord. <clears throat> so interesting to note that when I cast the Master of Waves on my end step, or you know during my turn at any point, he didn't use the single card he had in his hand uh, to remove Master of Waves. So my guess is he didn't have removal for him, uh, and he just drew one more card on that turn. So. If we uh, jam this Master of the Pearl Trident and Alpha Strike, uh, it seems like a good time to do so uh, because the opponent really seems to only have one card that could possibly be a removal spell. And if he does have, say, a uh, Fatal Push and he wants to get rid of... I assume he'd get, have to get rid of the Master of Waves because he's buffing the Mutavault and buffing the Elementals. If he got rid of the Master of Waves... Uh, these guys would still have Island Walk. I'd be getting in for just one, two, and... Sorry. Um, no, this guy would still be around, so two, three, and three, so that'd be eight. But in order to Fatal push the Master of Waves, uh, he'd have to get rid... Of, he'd have to crack a fetch land, which would put him at eight. So if he Fatal pushed the Master of Waves after cracking a fetch land, uh, I'd still be attacking for eight with Island Walk. So Fatal Push doesn't get him there in this particular scenario. If he got rid of the Island Walk Lord instead, uh, he could block... The two bigger guys, uh, I guess then it would be Mutavault and hmm. 
Oh, he got rid of this. Yeah, Mutavault will be the only 3 3. Block a Mutavault. Um, I don't know. Block my Harbinger. And then he'd still be taking <clears throat> 8 and more. Um, so it's possible the opponent just had no out. If, he, if in fact, uh, the single card he had, he had in his hand when I pl played the Master of Waves wasn't removal. That was my read, since he didn't remove the Master of Waves uh, on my turn. So I'm sorry if I'm not explaining this pretty well, but I just feel like this is um, a pretty safe spot to Alpha Strike. You guys can let me know your opinions uh, in the comment section, please. So swinging with uh, all these guys uh, having Island Walk, opponent's just throwing his guys in front of Elementals, and clearly this is overkill if he has no response. And overkill it was. So uh, Merfolk take game one. Let's see how game two went. <clears throat> okay, uh, opponent's going to be on the play again. Uh, this is a pretty sensational hand. Easy keep for me. It looks like the opponent kept as well. I'm going to start by cycling a Street Wraith. Cracking a Bloodstained Mire. Untapped Watery Grave into Thoughtseize. Straight from 20 down to 13. Uh, opponent took the Master of Waves, even though I'm super far away from being able to resolve that guy. Uh, I guess he's pretty frightened after getting wrecked by him in the last game. All right, draw a Curse Catcher. That's not too bad. Uh, so, of course, we're going to play that Ether Vial out. Opponent just passes through his second turn. I take Ether Vial up. And uh, I'll go with Cavern of Souls here just to make sure that Silvergill uh, resolves. The opponent doesn't know that I have this Curse Catcher. I drew it after he thought sees me. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to reveal him in order to resolve uh, Silvergill Adept. Sort of gives away uh, the trick, but you know, sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. So drew another land. Kind of unfortunate. So let's see, does opponent have anything on the end step? They crack their Bloodstained Mire uh, for a tapped Blood Crypt <clears throat> and follow it up with a Thought Scour. Now with the opponent tapped out, <clears throat> I'm going to take this opportunity to get thought, uh, Curse Catcher onto the board. Reason being uh, that if the opponent untaps and plays a third land, uh, they can pass the turn. And if I try to activate Ether Vial on their end step, they can respond with Kologon's Command and blow me out with Silver Gill. Uh, getting killed and also just destroying my Aether Vial. So Thought Scour will, will resolve. I'm not trying to counter that with Curse Catcher. We can see what they put in the yard. Just a land and a Thought Scour. All right, going to the opponent's third turn. They play a land and uh, looks like they're just again passing through here. Aether Vial goes up to two, uh, but I draw my sixth land. So we'll go to combat. Opponent's going to bolt the curse catcher here, which is um, I don't know, a signal that they, they have some sort of uh, important spell that they want to resolve. Kolagon's command uh, being a possibility. So. I think I made a mistake here. Uh, I played Mutavault thinking that I wanted to continue to uh, get power on the board while also obviously playing my land for the turn. I can get Kira in next turn with Aether Vial. But if I was thinking about uh, playing around Kolagon's command, uh, this would have been an excellent chance to get Kira onto the board. Uh, the opponents tapped below Kolagon uh, Mana. So I, instead I should have played a Blue Source and get uh, Kira onto the board. I guess I was potentially playing around a board wipe next turn by keeping Kira in hand, uh, assuming I could just keep applying some pressure with Silver Gill and Mutavault. But in hindsight, I feel like I probably should have gotten Kira on the table when I had the chance here. Well, let's see how it played out. Opponent gets a tap uh, un sorry, tapped Steam Vents. Already uh, 20 to 9. I'm still in a pretty solid position with two creatures on the board and the opponent at 9. Um, the only problem here is I just keep drawing lands. All right, so let's see. I untap, and I guess in response to the Ether Vial trigger, the opponent uh, is going to do what I feared. Uh, the Kolagons commanded uh, killing my Silvergill and my Ether Vial. I mean, I'm not too sad about the Ether Vial since I've got a million lands, 
but still, I could have played around that uh, a little bit more intelligently. Draw my seventh land, and at this point, um, realize that I didn't play optimally there. Get Kira on the table now while I have a chance. Uh, let's see, opponent's just passing through. Okay, draw my eighth land, at least it's a muta vault. Uh, I'm going to attack. If the opponent wants to snap cast or block, that's okay. Well, it looks like that's what he's doing. So, um, throws the Snapcaster under the bus. I think that he targeted a Lightning Bolt. Yeah, that makes sense because he can go to, uh, go to my face since he can't, uh, really bolt the Kira. Play out, uh, my second Muta Vault and just end the turn. Expected the bolt, but the opponent just, uh, let it go. Let's see what he has in his graveyard here. He's got a Thought Scour, two Thought Scours, a Lightning Bolt. I guess he might want to save that that Bolt. Still, it seemed a little bit strange to not use it. But anyhow, I guess it's not that big a deal. Leaving it in there, I could see the, uh, the value, I guess. Potentially representing that he has another Snapcaster, right? Leaving that Lightning Bolt, if we assume that it's not just a straight-up misplay. Opponent uh, finds his fourth land and passes the turn again. So I'll get this Curse Catcher out on the table. I'm going to activate Muta Vault and keep, uh, keep attacking. Alright, another Snapcaster. What's he going to target this time? He now has access to two lands. So just went with Thought Scour this time. Try to get some value out of this Snapcaster. The feeling that um, he's going to throw him in front of the Muta Vault again. That is, in fact, what happened. Cracks a polluted delta, gets a tapped watery grave, and doesn't play his thought scour. I think that was a misplay. Opponent's already down to four here. I'm at 20. Seems like there's very few ways that we can lose this game. Anger of the Gods is a, <laughs> a decent way that we can lose the game. Always uh, sack the Curse Catcher to make the opponent pay one more mana. So I guess that was, uh, in theory, what I was playing around when I kept Kira in my hand earlier. Okay, that is my uh, ninth land, including my two Muta Vaults that have already bitten the dust. So we got the opponent down to three. And Street Wraith, hard cast as a 3 4. <laughs> so, Silvergill Adept paying 5 for this guy. I have a feeling, let's see what he draws me. Land? Ah, well, Regery, that's something. Play uh, another land. So, the opponent does have three cards, but I'm sorry I just uh, clicked through that, that Kolagons command that he just played. Let's go ahead and see what modes were chosen there. Uh, he returned Snapcaster Mage to his hand and uh, killed off my Silvergill Adept. So yeah, that's that's the value uh, of the late game Snapcaster Kolagons command. It just gets really, really crazy. Um, they can keep cycling those things. They can cast Snapcaster, flashing back Kolagon's command, and if they draw another Kolagon's command, they, I don't know, it's just, it's pretty gross. Uh, Curse Catcher's a creature, but... Not... So, I'm going to start with the Curse Catcher, just in case the opponent has some, like a Terminate in hand or something. Uh, we don't want to play the Regery out first. Play the Curse Catcher out first. Even though typically we would play out the Regery first to get a uh, tap or untap, it really doesn't matter in this uh, situation. We'd rather put the Curse Catcher onto the table first. Alright. Opponent, four cards in hand. Chooses to attack with the Street Wraith. Uh, he's a 3-4. We don't have profitable blocks, so we'll go down to 14. Still plenty of life, right? Harbor to the Tides is a really interesting draw. Now we know he has a Snapcaster Mage in hand, which at any point could just flash back this uh, Anger of the Gods. So committing yet another creature to the board uh, seems poor. He could play his Snapcaster, block the Regery, and 
I don't know, Colagon's Command, the Curse Catcher. Uh, does he have another Snapcaster in here? God, he could recur another Snapcaster. So we're in kind of a poor position here. Um, even sort of at the least, next turn he could Snapcaster Anger of the Gods to wipe my board. So I, one thing to, to possibly do is to keep Harbinger in hand until the opponent's end step and try to surprise him with it since his life total is so low. Maybe he cracks another fetch next turn, he goes down to two. Thinks he's safe after wiping my board with Anger of the Gods. Uh, thinking that I'll play out creatures, um, but they'll have summoning sickness. But if I can get in for the final two with Harbinger, that would be pretty sweet. Uh, but with this tapped Street Wraith, I don't know. I think I just decided it was. It seems smart to, to bounce the Street Wraith. So, all right, the opponent's doing something on my draw step. Let's see, that, that this might change the um, equation a little bit here. So he's targeting Lightning Bolt in the graveyard. Which makes sense, because if he targeted Colligon's Command, I would have Curse Catcher uh, to counter it. So Snapcaster resolves. Uh, on my main phase, I am going to bounce this Street Wraith. If, if he uh, cycles this guy, he goes all the way down to 1, which takes him off of any future fetch activations. Going to try to tap his Snapcaster Mage here. Um, but he does have access to the Lightning Bolt, so we're not going to be able to get in for lethal, even though we have 4 power right now. Alright, bounce that Street Wraith. If we get in even for a point of damage with Curse Catcher this turn, after Rejury gets Lightning Bolted, uh, he won't be able to cycle the Street Wraith anyway. So the opponent bolts the Rejury. That was uh, pretty predictable. Gonna try to swing for one here with the Curse Catcher. The opponent has another removal spell. Uh, I'll sack the Curse Catcher, as usual. Uh, and that kind of stinks. Didn't do anything that turn, and the opponent still has four cards in hand. With a Street Wraith uh, potentially netting him another card if he doesn't want to cast that guy again. Opponent's going to swing with the Snapcaster, and we really cannot block in this position. I mean, Harbinger represents some devotion for Master of Waves. There's another Rejury, uh, but with the opponent sitting on four cards, let's see. Draw step, Snapcaster, uh, targeting Colagon's Command this time, since I don't have the Curse Catcher on the board anymore. This is getting uh, rougher and rougher. Alright, so at this point he's going to kill my creature and make me discard my Rejury. So dying to Snapcaster Beats is... <laughs> Pretty embarrassing, but I did draw nine lands this turn, uh, this game. Death Shadow is a 10 10. I'm gonna go to my draw step just to see what I get. Opponent plays a land. There's a Master of Waves. It's something, right? Can block the Death Shadow uh, with the Elemental for a turn. Cracks the uh, fetch going down to two, and he has another Fatal Push, uh, which had that ability uh, Revolt. So if um, if a permanent you controlled left the battlefield. So he cracked a fetch, and it fatal pushed my 4-drop. So he obviously has overkill. That was a frustrating game. I drew way too many lands and you know just didn't really do very much. Uh, I would like to play first this game. This is a nice hand. I can keep this. Uh, Master of Waves does a lot of work in this matchup if the opponent doesn't happen to have a uh, Fatal Push in hand. He lives through Anger of the Gods, he lives through uh, Lightning Bolts. Alright, opponent opening with Serum Visions. We can see uh, what he did with it. Top, top. Alright, so I'm just going to push out the Master of the Pearl Trident here. If he has removal for it, so be it. But uh, Harbinger of the Tide... Tides has uh, some extra value that we can get, and we don't want to just waste that right now. So, uh, let's see. Click through that too quickly. The opponent uh, cast Collective Brutality there, um, not discarding anything, so just killing the Master of the Pearl Trident. Drew into a Curse Catcher, which is nice, because I can, play, uh, I can now play out the Harbinger and Curse Catcher this turn to establish more devotion for Master of Waves. Once the opponent removed the Lord of Atlantis, the math for the Harbinger uh, changed. We need to develop our board, uh, so 
even having a 2-2 bear right now with no extra value is fine. Curse Catcher is going to prevent any Colagon's commands this turn. Being on the play uh, feels good since we get to uh, get to Master of Waves uh, sooner. So what is happening here? Oh, it's probably doing something with the graveyard. Yeah, there's a Gurmag Angler. Not afraid of that guy at all. Just a uh, vanilla 5-5 five five with uh, an empty graveyard now. Okay, Silvergill Adept is going to have to wait since uh, Master of Waves is definitely the way to go right now. Can attack into the Grimag Angler, so just pass it back to the opponent after um, resolving Master of Waves with four tokens. So Inquisition, a little bit unfortunate since he gets to take this Silvergill Adept, but I'd rather see this at this point than Thoughtseize since Master of Waves is going to make all of our elementals a lot bigger. Can't take the Master of Waves, so he takes the Silvergill Adept. Probably not going to attack with the Grimag Angler. Okay, uh, third Master of Waves, things getting better and better. Definitely just going to push this guy out onto the board. So Anger of the Gods would be pretty good for the opponent here. What's happening? Okay, so he's going to bolt the Harbinger just to prevent me from getting uh, more tokens. Seems reasonable. And also sort of indicates that he might not have a Wrath in hand. Because if he had the Wrath, he wouldn't care if I got multiple elementals and probably choose to save his Lightning Bolt. Alright, so I'm going to attack with all of my elementals now as 3 twos. Uh, he could eat one of them, but he's still going to take 9. You get a pretty insane clock. Alright, looks like he is going to attack. Interesting. What's the follow up? Well, here's a Death Shadow. Uh, I guess he's just giving up. I mean, that's kind of. St I guess he's dead on board anyway, right? But if if that's the case, he could just concede. So I drew the fourth Master of Waves. It doesn't happen that often. Um, I guess it's making up for giving me all my deck is making uh, up for giving me all those lands last game by giving me all these Master of Waves this game. So again, um, this is a situation where uh, pushing a creature out on the board during our first main phase makes a lot of sense because it makes all our other creatures a lot bigger. So we're going to attack with five four threes, and the opponent scooped. All right, so that was the uh, fifth round against Grixis Death Shadow, and uh, I managed to go five zero in this modern friendly league. I just came back from uh, a two month break. I played one other league before this one after coming back from the break, which I went four one in. I forget who I lost to uh, Eldrazi and Taxes, which is a really hard matchup for us. Actually, came really close to going 5-0 in that one also, but just I had I had a, a game against Eldrazi Shadow Eldrazi Taxes, where I just like similar to the last game where I drew like nine lands and just couldn't really do anything. So uh, let me know your guys' thoughts. Uh, I didn't see in this league uh, or in the previous one the Jund uh, Death Shadow deck, which I think is the closest to the sort of old school build. Um, the sort of quote-unquote sort of suicide or suicide zoo uh, version of the deck. We have seen, actually I guess in this one league here, we saw Esper, Death Shadow, and Grixis, Death Shadow. Both of them seem like really solid matchups uh, for Merfolk. Esper uh, seems good just because, I don't know, that, that color combination is just traditionally weak in Modern. I guess the Path to Exile they have access to is pretty good, um, but... They just give us access to Island Walk, and Master of Waves is such a beating against uh, red decks that we, we can do pretty well against Grixis as well. So yeah, that's it. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. I, I always appreciate that. And let me know your thoughts on my plays and you know how Merfolk is positioned right now uh, in this new metagame where Death Shadow is sitting at the top of the pile. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, please tune in for my next videos where I guess I'll probably be uh, posting more modern friendly leagues. Thanks a lot, guys, and I'll see you soon. Bye.